Thank you, Vicki. I'm thrilled to be moderating this important session today. At TELUS, when we review drugs for formulary listing decisions, um, there, uh, we evaluate both clinical and economic evidence. The clinical evidence is in the form of a controlled study used to determine whether the drug works and if it is safe. However, there are many uncertainties about the population to be treated, the history of the disease, durability of clinical effects compared to other treatments, safety, cost effectiveness, and the impact on the plan financially. This means that some pharmaceuticals may enter the market with limited evidence uh, that demonstrate effectiveness, while at the same time, there's pressure for the payers to make pricing and reimbursement decisions about these drugs at the point of market launch. To further complicate things, many of these drugs have a very high price tag, and thus decisions about their value are challenging, which can result in delaying or even denying listing of drugs on uh, planned formularies. For example, later this afternoon, you will hear about the top 10 most costly drugs from the TELUS Book of Business in 2022. It shows that the average cost per claimant for these 10 drugs ranged from about $400,000 per year to as high as $1.8 million per year. Obviously, there is reason to be concerned about the sustainability of drug plans. We are faced with a situation where the drugs show promise, but the financial risk of making the wrong decision could be very costly if the drug does not provide benefit. As a result, various stakeholders have started embracing real-world evidence as a source to help inform their decision-making. Real-world evidence analyzes data about the use and benefits of an intervention in the real world. Real-world data is literally everywhere. For example, I wear this watch, it tells me it's always collecting data. It tells me when to sit, when to breathe, that I'm not exercising enough. You know, finding this data, the stuff that we need, and accessing it, leveraging it, and fit, make sure it's fit for purpose are all some of the challenges that we face in this area. Today, we have panelists from the insurance industry, the pharmaceutical industry, a public health technology assessment agency, and a real-world evidence producer to discuss how private payers might use real-world evidence in their decision-making to improve access to effective medications for their plan members. Each panelist will provide a brief presentation to share their perspectives. Afterwards, we will have a discussion among the panelists, and then we will open it out up to the audience to, to ask questions. So now it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our all-female panel. First, we'll hear from Bobby Curry, who will provide the private payer view. Bobby is manager of pharmaceutical relations at Canada Life, where she leads product listing agreement discussions and develops innovative industry partnerships. Bobby has previously led the clinical pharmacy team at Canada Life. She is a registered pharmacist and has held roles as a frontline community pharmacist, an entrepreneur and specialist in pharmacy operations. Following that, we will hear from Nicole Mittman from the Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technologies in Health, also known as CADETH. She will talk about what is happening in the public payer space. Nicole is Vice President of Scientific Evidence, Methodologies and Resources at CADETH. She promotes active learning, assures rigor and quality, links science to strategy, and shares evidence through CADETH's journal and other sources. She has conducted and collaborated on notable research in economic evaluations, outcomes research, and drug patient safety. Our third speaker is Karen Grandmaison from Pfizer Canada. Karen will shed light on how the pharmaceutical industry collects and uses real world evidence to assess value of their products. Karen is vice president of access and government relations at Pfizer and a member of the executive management team. She leads the team responsible for Pfizer Canada's public and private payer engagement strategies, pricing and reimbursement operations and engagements with provincial governments. She has spent most of her career in the life sciences sector. To round out the panel, we will hear from Catherine Beauchemin to give a consultant's experience with generating evidence to fill in data gaps for drugs being considered for formulary listing. Catherine is a partner at Perry Firm, a consulting company specializing in health economics and market access in Canada. She is an associate professor at the University of Montreal and a lecturer at the University of Sherbrooke. She recently co-founded the Proxy Network, an innovative real-world evidence initiative generating patient-centered evidence. Now, Bobby, over to you in Winnipeg. 
Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me. And, uh, you know, I'm really excited to talk about this, uh, this real world evidence topic today. It's something that, you know, I've been exploring the last few years, and I think there's a lot of potential here. So um, as already mentioned, my background is in community pharmacy and business operations. But I came to Canada Life a few years ago to really focus in on drug evaluation for drug plans. And our process evaluates the drugs with three pillars, clinical, economic, and stakeholder value. So that's the lens that I'm bringing to this conversation, looking for value for our sponsors and the plan members that are relying on us for drug coverage. So I wanna to touch today on why I think real world evidence matters for private drug plans, some of the challenges I see with real world evidence today and all of that potential that I see for the future. So if we go to the next slide, um, everything at Canada Life really starts with our values. So our vision is customer centric and our purpose is to improve the financial, physical and mental well-being of Canadians. In our drug programs, uh, on the next slide, you'll see that this translates into our dual bottom line philosophy, balancing the needs of plan members with those cost needs of plan sponsors. Uh, on the next slide, I just want to talk a little bit about some of that need for evidence, where that gap really is. My team today, like Daria said, is, is focused on product listing agreements. So we're negotiating drug prices based on those pillars that I talked about, clinical, economic, stakeholder value. And these kinds of agreements are really powerful tools for managing drug plan costs. And we're often looking to clinical trials and data like that in a submission package to help us understand that drug better and you know, um, make mutually beneficial agreements. But as Doria mentioned, there's a lot of uncertainty still in some of those um, packages. So maybe the number of people in a clinical trial was really low. That can make it hard for us to interpret the results. Or maybe the size of the patient population is an unknown. And that happens sometimes. Uh, an example can be in the rare disease space. When something's really rare, doctors don't always know to test for it. And when a new exciting drug comes out, it can really create some more awareness about the testing and bring more people in to be evaluated. And that can be a really good thing. Um, I think about the hepatitis C surge uh, that we saw a few years ago when the new drugs came out. Um, there was so much excitement for them that more people thought about hepatitis C and went in to get tested. So that's just one of those unknowns that we have to be thinking about. Um, another issue can be sometimes that we don't know how much of a drug is going to be used when an individual injection could cost thousands of dollars, doubling the dose just to see how well it works can be really expensive. Um, more and more of these drugs are coming to market with questions like this unanswered. But when a drug is showing a lot of promise in a devastating or life-threatening condition, sometimes patients don't really wanna wait for every I to get dotted and every T to get crossed. As a payer though, we really need to be thinking about, is that drug gonna live up to that promise? Is there value for money? And real world evidence can help fill that gap. Uh, it can help us confirm effectiveness for those patients and support that assumption of value. Rising drug plan costs means that value is more important than ever. As Dari mentioned, drugs are getting pretty expensive, but that value equation for a private drug plan can be a little different than it is for a public plan in, in some cases. The obvious difference is you know, hospital costs, but we also have to remember that there's a lot of private plans that are for workplaces where productivity and absenteeism and disability claims are also really important. And those quality of life indicators are often missing from the current uh, submission evidence packages that we're seeing. We have to use more qualitative assumption, assumptions about the drugs. Real world evidence, again, could help us fill that gap. So let's talk about the potential on the next slide. Um, with that robust real world evidence, we could share risks more effectively, which is really what insurance is all about. And we would also have a lot more tools to manage costs throughout the entire life cycle of a drug, broadening or narrowing co coverage, uh, depending on what the data is telling us. And really that ultimate goal of any kind of healthcare data analysis is preventative care. Imagine being able to intervene early for someone who's on their way to disability and helping them stay healthier longer. And those are just some of the questions that private payers have. And there just isn't a lot of strong data to help us uh, answer those questions. So in the next slide, you know, we, we ask things like, will this new treatment work as well in the real world as it does for clinical trials? Um, could we help someone avoid a disability? If we can, there's a huge clinical and financial value there. Does the disease ease caregiver burden? 
or improve productivity or improve quality of life? And there's a lot of data points that can help us answer all those questions. I mean, Daria mentioned her smartwatch, and that's certainly a data source. But there's also drug claims data, disability databases, electronic medical records in the doctor's offices, sick, sick day databases at an employer, um, paramedical utilization, patient reported outcomes. Those are all just inputs that we would need to align to provide a lot of those really good insights that we're looking for. And on the next slide, um, some of the challenges that I'm seeing. And I think alignment is a big part of that. Uh, all of these data sources exist independently. Drug claims data is in one system at your primary insurer, maybe a different system at your spouse plan, a totally different system at your provincial plan. All of those different sources have to align to help us see the whole picture of someone. So a powerful real world evidence program is gonna include a lot of different sources of data and get a clear picture of someone's health um, wherever they are in, in their life, whether they're in a hospital or maybe out in the community getting coverage through their private plan. And once we get all that data alignment, we still have to figure out what questions to ask. The end users, patients and clinicians and public payers and private payers, we're all gonna have different questions that we want answers to. And you know, I'm just a business person, so I kind of picture it like Googling, or I guess today, maybe it's more like asking chat GPT, uh, a question, but we know that ChatGPT can be misleading sometimes or, or just wrong. And that answer that we get from the real world evidence is gonna have similar caveats around it. Um, so we need to really be asking smart questions and have some good guardrails around how the answers come to us. So to me, a robust data set is gonna have a holistic view, lots of different perspectives and some expert guides along the way as well. So uh, next slide. In my day-to-day, -day, I really don't pretend to be a data scientist. Instead, I work with our data team to explore their expertise and how to, how to get answers. I give them the question and they help me find answers. Um, we have data scientists and AI experts who put our data together and try to find answers to, um, to those questions, get at more efficient processes, and just really make better decisions using uh, data to support us. And, they have a lot of that understanding that I need to be give to give me usable data answers. Um, next slide. So we really try to incorporate data through the whole life cycle of our, our management program. We use some real world data points already today, usually, like I said, in, as qualitative measures in our drug evaluations. But you know, I would love to see more outcomes based management for our drug plans. And at the end of the day, I think we're just getting started with real world evidence. Um, kind of my final slide here uh, is the next one. There we go. Uh, there's a lot of challenges that I think we do have to overcome, but there's so much potential here that I do think it's really worth exploring and figuring out how to get there. Um, we need to make really good decisions, which means we need the best available evidence. Thank you for your time. I'm really looking forward to uh, the question and answer period at, at the end here. That's great. Thank you, Bobby. I'm sure that will generate um, lots of questions from our audience. Now we will hear from Nicole for the public payer perspective. Thanks so much, Daria, and thanks, Bobby, for setting the stage for me so well and, and uh, appreciate this all-women panel, most of whom have decided to wear pink, so fantastic for all of us. Um, and next slide, please. So first, I'd like to start out um, with a, a statement. So CADIS acknowledges the critical need for Indigenous perspectives in the Canadian healthcare system. In both historical and ongoing ways, Indigenous peoples and communities in Canada have been excluded for, uh, from and or harmed by medical research or have faced systemic racism and prejudice within the health system. As a health system leader, uh, CADIS affirms their commitment to define CADIS's role to advocate, affirm, uh, or amplify and, uh, out and be an ally to Indigenous peoples and communities in Canada, create opportunities for our own organization to learn more about how uh, about their history uh, and about reconciliation as well, collaboratively define um, and in a way that CADIS can address some of the challenges along with our health technology assessments and how to include and not limit to incorporating Indigenous research methodologies and operations in the organization and create a space to commit resources within our own organization to ensure Indigenous voices are heard and that have an influence on the way we do our work. Next slide, please. 
So the first one of uh, just starting with a disclosure slide, my own personal disclosure, um, uh, I'm an employee of CADF and uh, have no commercial interest um, and still have an academic uh, uh, practice uh, and uh, have some grants that are still funded and will uh, hopefully be done soon. Um, next slide, please. And here's our disclosure for CADF. I mean, certainly it is, uh, CADF is a, an organization that is funded by our provinces and territories and the federal ministries of health, with the exception of Quebec, uh, to understand the value of health technologies across the system and to the system payer. Uh, we do receive some funding from pharmaceutical industries and sponsors, uh, as well as through our scientific advice program. Next slide, please. So uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with our organization, we are a not-for-profit organization responsible for providing uh, Canada's healthcare decision makers with objective clinical evidence um, in on new technologies and thinking about the way that we look at evidence, appraise evidence, and provide advice on that particular evidence to support decision making at the federal, provincial, and territorial level. Next slide, please. Um, and for the placement, you know, often people wonder where we sit in the um, in the environment as well. So we have Health Canada who actually under, or makes assessments on whether a drug or a technology or a device is safe and whether it works. Um, then our organization, CABIS, actually, how do we compare or how does that technology compare to existing technologies? What is the value of that particular technology in the health system space? And then you have other organizations, including the Patent Medicine Prices Review Board, and then our public drug plans, including the negotiation, which is our Pan-Canadian Pricing Alliance. Next slide, please. So uh, we heard already about different examples um, about real-world evidence. We're defining it the following way, which is in line with Health Canada as well. It's evidence about the use or safety or effectiveness of a medical product, technology, and or drug, and it's based on data that actually comes from the real-world healthcare setting, um, and it's certainly playing an increasing role. And I think we want to start there because it can mean everything to people, and it can mean nothing to people. So there are so many, as we already saw with Darius Watch, um, or it could be patient reported outcomes or quality improvement information, could be just daily utilization or drug utilization or understanding the scope of practice in the environment that you're looking at. But it can also mean safety. So what are the safety parameters untoward adverse events and or it could also mean effectiveness. And so what actually how well does that technology work in a system where you may not have actually had exposure to the patient's uh, in the or in the original clinical trial space. Next slide, please. So what I did want to say is it does not automatically equal access. Um, that it does not, and it will not replace a randomized control trial. It, we, the way we're thinking about it is complementary. We still have to use the Health Canada process, the regulator process of approving drugs for a certain indications and the and the structure that they have built into uh, their work. But if we don't have enough information, how do we continue to think about drugs and understand their value? And this is an opportunity for real-world evidence to be complementary. It has, as I've already said, different meanings to different people. Um, it does not provide causality. So one of the things that people often uh, criticize uh, observational studies or real-world evidence studies uh, is that, you know, well, we can't determine if something actually works, which is actually what happens in a randomized controlled trial, sort of a cause and an effect. Um, it does not help us with that, but we can certainly look at trends and we can look at associations. Um, it cannot be conducted for everything and nor should it be conducted for everything. There are certain times where real world evidence can bolster or perhaps complement the existing clinical trial literature, but should it be conducted for everything? Uh, and it's also um, an issue being faced by all health technology agencies around the globe. So any agency in, uh, that actually conducts uh, health technology assessments and determines the value of uh, new technologies is facing the issue of how to incorporate or when to incorporate real-world evidence. And may I say, um, you know, real-world evidence is a really a, just a new name for something that we've been talking about for years pharmacovigilance, pharmacosafety, pharmacoepidemiology, at least in the drug space, and then moving over into the epi space for devices and clinical interventions. So it's repackaging that name, but thinking about it now in a more fulsome way. Next slide, please. So this is our usual evidence pyramid, and, and we heard, you know, some of the data points that, you know, if you want to have a drug approved, you have a clinical trial, 
um, and you actually are at the top of the evidence pyramid as you know, sort of systematic reviews and randomized controlled trials. And then beyond that, you have observational studies. And with an increase uh, in potential bias, but also an increase in control for randomized controlled trials. So often individuals who work in this particular space are using those parameters to assess and appraise these kinds of new uh, designs. Next slide, please. So, you know, on the left-hand side, this is what a clinical trial is. On the right-hand side, this is where uh, folks who actually are in the real world often look like. So the people who are enrolled in clinical trials as part of their inclusion criteria are often not or may not be reflective of who's actually getting access to the drug in the real world space. So how do we then understand if those drugs continue to work or if they continue to be safe? And so is this an opportunity for real world evidence to step into? Next slide, please. So this is the International Society for Pharmacoeconomics and Outcomes Research. Uh, and they have, every year they publish a top 10 list. This was the 2022 top five out of 10 list that I'm showing here but really saying that their number one issue is real world evidence. So understanding how to incorporate, understanding how to use it, understanding when it can be used to help support either submissions or early advice or even potentially reassessment. And then you see a number of the other elements there around including equity considerations. So is the ability for real world evidence, can we actually start to understand the demographics of the population and help with the value assessment as well? And then as we already heard about some of the financial issues around new technologies as well. So understanding uh, how drugs continue to work or if they continue to be safe is a real issue. Next slide, please. So in uh, early 2021, we had a, a, in collaboration with the Canadian Institutes for Health uh, Research uh, and the Canadian Organization for Rare Disorders and our organization, CADIS, uh, conducted a best range exchange where we started, we brought together decision makers, we brought together thinkers, methodologists to understand what is the space in real world evidence and what are the challenges that we're facing. Um, and really came down to that there is a data problem. We're actually pretty data rich. But then um, how do we actually pull that together with information? And actually, we don't know often where some of the data sets are. Um, there is an awareness problem. So this is the not knowing how to access it. Where is it? What's the quality of that particular data? And then how do we coordinate with one another to do this? And so working, you know, how does the public and the private space work together as well? Next slide, please. So what can RWE do and what can't it do? Next slide. So the, what we've been thinking is it can fill gaps and uncertainty, and then Bobby said the same thing, you know, is this an opportunity for us to think about if we don't know everything from the clinical trial, which may be a 60-day clinical trial, what happens after day 60, at day 61 and beyond? If it's a chronic illness, how can we start to fill those gaps about knowledge with respect to utilization, with respect to patient reported outcomes, with respect to uh, safety and effectiveness? Um, it does not lead to automatic approval. Um, it still needs to have a critical appraisal. So much like clinical trials, you still need to look at the study design. You still need to look at some of the governance structures. And actually, for real-world evidence, we one of the things that we take for granted in the in the randomized controlled trial space is there is a governance structure, there is a consent form, there is a protocol that's published on clinicaltrials.gov, there is a data safety monitoring board. So all of the governance structures that have been built into the clinical trial platform are often unknown in a real-world evidence or observational study or registry study, for example. So trying to understand, you know, were you able to do this analysis? Did you have permission? Uh, were you allowed to link the data? Uh, were you, uh, you know, were you actually able to have the right outcomes to do that kind of work? So still needs a critical appraisal to look at, you know, how good the study is um, and some of the limitations of that particular study. So that work still needs to happen. Um, and certainly it doesn't, we talked about this earlier, does not provide causality, but we still need to provide, and I think this is, you know, listening to Bobby beforehand, you know, where um, looking at those outcomes managed agreements, how are we certain that we're looking at the right outcome? And so as we think about, you know, what outcome to whom, is it the payer, is it the public payer versus the private payer, is it the patient, and are we measuring the right outcomes? Next slide, please. So I wanted to highlight this slide. It's a little bit busy, but one of the things that we had uh, occurring at our organization over the last two years was to look at the rare disease space. 
and think about where can we find data? Where do, what information is required by decision makers? How can we ensure that we have standards in order to be able to appraise? Um, and so these are, uh, the next couple of slides will actually talk about some of the work that we've been doing in this particular space, which will piggyback on that best brains exchange, talking about data, uh, awareness, and collaboration. Next slide, please. So our first uh, goal was to think about uh, sometimes we need to have early advice uh, and think about things in the early cycle or the life cycle of the drug and uh, and or technology. And, and Bobby, you mentioned, you know, early sort of uh, analysis, you know, in thinking about how do we expand that kind of evidence? What is required by the time we get to the decision making stage? What information is required and how do we actually collect that information? So we've just launched that um, as CADIS as our early scientific advice program to think about real world evidence along the way to ensure that we have these discussions around the kinds of methods, the kinds of study designs. And, and CADIS has accepted real world evidence um, and we do ex we continue to accept real world evidence. But I think when we get, for example, a study that comes from uh, a jurisdiction that's outside of our environment, so outside of Canada, so for example, Europe, you know, how do we assess that? Uh, and so, and how do we start to think about the, the quality of that evidence? And so starting to think about it early sets us up for later analysis. Next slide, please. Uh, our other goal was, as mentioned, you know, we have various study designs. You can have everything from a case report in a rare disease, where there may not be a fulsome clinical trial, all the way to published literature. And so how do we start to review these? And the first thing that we needed to do is sort of level set around what are the standards required to do that kind of analysis? So we have are in the process of finalizing a, a guidance document that we're working together with the regulator, so Health Canada, and our, part, our sister partner, Ines, um, and to understand what are the common elements that we need to see reported when we're receiving uh, uh, real-world evidence studies to each of our organizations. We will implement differently um, uh, across as the regulator will compared to a health technology assessment, but what are the elements that we actually need to think about, which I've already highlighted that we take for granted what's in a clinical trial space. We may not have all that information available, so we're trying to highlight it as well. Next stage, or next slide. Here's a, a group of individuals and organizations that have worked on this real-world evidence guidance. Uh, certainly, we have a, a guidance working group. We have a real-world evidence steering committee with a number of different organizations who have tried to move this initiative forward. Next slide, please. Uh, and also understand, sort of the, develop the kinds of knowledge that we need for the generation. So create an atlas of or an inventory of what data sets are available. For us, And so I'm sure we'll have a lot of discussion in the private space about what potential data is available, but we'll go on to the next slide. You know, just quickly, you know, think about where are inventories of data. So if you're looking for drug utilization information and there's a question about the use, you know, how do you go, which data sets do you go to? If you have a question about the genetic information, where would you go to? You know, if you had a question about demographic information, you know, here are different sources by which you can actually start to ask those questions. And part of our job in this two-year learning period was to allow us to ask those kinds of questions and determine where those data sets lie. Next slide, please. So this is just the, uh, an inventory of data sets that is available through the Canadian Institute for Health Information. You know, everything from different um, emergency visits to hospitalizations to other kinds of data sets. And some of that is province specific, but just allows us to create and understand how we can ask those particular questions as well. Next slide, please. Um, the other part of this inventory was to understand, especially in the rare disease space, you know, where are registries? And registries are another source of potential evidence or real world evidence. And thinking about where are the, you know, who, who holds these registries and registries particularly can be funded by uh, an industry partner, can be funded by a grant, can be funded by a ministry of health, can be funded by a patient organization and, or, and various mixtures of all of those, all with different kinds of standards and all with different kinds of outcomes that they're collecting. So, you know, trying to get a handle on Canadian disease registries. And then there's also a tool to look at the quality of those particular registries. So we work together with these registries here um, to understand content, uh, governance, structure, and elements that they actually have. Next slide, please. 
Um, and then in order to do some of this work, we also worked on some learning projects. And here we actually had multi-stakeholder opportunities to bring in different uh, payers, different patients, different clinicians, different methodologists at the table to talk about what are the most important outcomes you have for a specific disease, and then to also work with individual data sets uh, on a case-by-case -case basis to see if we can actually access data and what we could learn. Next slide, please. So this just get, these are our four, uh, sorry, five learn by, learning by doing projects. Um, you know, in the rare disease space where we had some multi-stakeholder meetings with patients, with clinicians, with payers, um, and, and data holders to talk about outcomes and how we can actually determine what is the right outcome to collect. And then also working with individual data sets along uh, how do we access data. So working with Chi High or the Canadian Institutes for Health Information and Statistics Canada along the way. Next slide, please. Um, and our Last goal was really, can we then set up the building blocks for this rare disease work to allow us so that when we have a new drug or technology that comes through this particular space, how do we start to set it up so that we can either do early scientific advice or we can actually ask for the right kinds of outcomes, or how do we collect those right kinds of outcomes as well? Next slide, please. Um, and so really, you know, as we think about it, uh, the work that we're trying to do is expand the evidence base. And then how do we enhance our deliberation using that evidence as well uh, at our organization? And then how do we start, start to talk about that kind of real world evidence as we start to include and deliberate on it? Next slide, please. Uh, and then so lots of opportunities for us and where are the next steps, you know, thinking about how do we continue to link data? How do we expand the kinds of data sets? How do we understand the kinds of data sets that are out there? So everything from administrative data to public payers to private payers, to um, registries, to patient support programs. Uh, and so how do we actually start to build a, a common discussion or build a common sort of metric around those and with respect to standards and outcomes? Next slide, please. And really, you know, link, leverage, liberate, and learn. And I think that's sort of the tactic that we're taking at the organization. Thank you, that's my last slide. So many exciting things um, happening at CADF um, with respect to real world evidence. Um, so we've heard from both a public and private payer um, perspective and their needs. Now we'll hear from real world evidence producers and I'll start with Karen from Pfizer to talk about their real world evidence generation program. Good afternoon everyone. I'm very pleased uh, to be here, delighted to participate in this uh, important conversation. Thank you, Daria and the team at TELUS uh, for inviting our perspective. I really enjoyed hearing uh, Bobby and Nicole as well. They really set up uh, the conversation well. So I'll focus on, on uh, our perspective uh, at the manufacturer level not to repeat many of the same themes uh, that, uh, that they've mentioned. I did want, however, to start with um, saying that we're very lucky. Over the next few years, there will be many new innovations that will come on the market. Uh, rare disease is one area, oncology, women's health, and that's amazing news. Everyone knows that when you're a patient, or a caregiver, uh, we are extremely grateful when these innovations exist and especially when we can access them. Everyone here uh, attending this afternoon recognizes the huge benefits that the private sector brings in terms of timely and broad access to, to treatment. We say at Pfizer that time is life, so we try to accelerate really these therapies, uh, innovative therapies reaching the hands of patients. And we do recognize that sometimes we'll need to rely on real world data to complement uh, the clinical data and demonstrate the full value of the therapeutic innovation beyond what is measured in clinical trials. And the goal is really to help uh, the payers and the decision makers have uh, the full portrait uh, as much as possible, a holistic picture of that value. And for that to happen, really uh, the collaboration between manufacturers and all of the stakeholders, uh, that's what will 
bring results and you've heard it already so uh, I echo I echo this I did want to start with um, just looking at some of the potential avenues for real-world evidence. Um, it is not for everything. It's uh, an investment of resources, and, and the value is uh, clear in some instances. It has gaps in others, so a targeted approach works well in terms of real-world evidence. Some of the examples, uh, very concretely, where a payer might want to collect real-world evidence. For example, to assess the value. If we take a well treated patient who's on a monoclonal antibody for his arthritis condition that can prevent uh, him from having to retire early because of that condition. And instead, he continues to work longer and more productively. That's a huge value, not only for the individual, but also uh, for the plan sponsor because it reduces turnover and related costs, and especially in a, in a shortage situation like we are right now. Sometimes we may want to collect data to understand patient preferences, better understand the needs of those who are suffering with a particular condition. One example of that could be an oncology patient who may prefer, if, if uh, the clinical um, judgment is, uh, is there also, to take an oral treatment instead of an infused treatment because this can decrease the time spent getting that treatment in a center and improve her ability to remain active, remain a caregiver, and be productive. So there can be value in measuring these benefits um, and including competitiveness on benefits package. Real world evidence can help enable innovative contracting. So in some cases, uh, especially in, in high, well, unmet needs and, and uh, high uncertainty, real world evidence can be collected after a drug is reimbursed to measure effectiveness and with an agreement to um, collect additional evidence, which is predetermined. What's really interesting as well, uh, and it was mentioned uh, by Nicole, is real world evidence is in real life uh, healthcare settings, which typically represent more diverse populations. So that's an interesting element of, of diversity and equity as well. And at the end of the day, real world evidence can help support our shared goal of uh, providing timely access and optimizing the value of those therapies. At Pfizer, I'll talk about some of our activities right now. Uh, we have, of course, our market access team looking at that, working closely with our medical teams, uh, and that's to ensure the highest standards in all of our initiatives. Uh, we do uh, work very closely as well with our digital innovation team because the future is digital, uh, and Daria is wearing her watch, and uh, there's many wearables and electronic data, uh, AI coming. We've also set up a global center of excellence within Pfizer to leverage our experience and expertise on real-world evidence projects uh, from around the world. Just this morning, I read from my colleague in Denmark that they published a project uh, on a cancer therapy that showed, you know, that demonstrated survival uh, outcomes, but also looked at and demonstrated that with a particular therapy, the spouse of the patient utilized less healthcare resources for a certain number of years after um, the treatment started. So, so it's really, you know, all around the patient, there's value uh, as well. Burden of chronic disease. Uh, so we're collaborating with a stakeholder in the private uh, space to explore how we can better understand the impact of obesity in the workplace. We'd like to determine the baseline impact, like financial, clinical, humanistic lens of this complex chronic disease, and, and then assess with criteria the value of, of treatment options. That's one thing we're exploring. 
Another project that we have on productivity is uh, collaborating with University of British Columbia researchers to assess the value of lost productivity in uh, three disease areas that are unique in the impact uh, that they have on patients. One is migraine, and as you know, this is a highly disruptive condition, can lead to an inability to function and, and missed uh, work. We're looking also at atopic dermatitis, which is very different, highly symptomatic. Uh, patients can get severe rash and itch, and the consequences of it is the patients can lose quality sleep. There's social stigma associated with these rash, isolation, and poor quality of life. So what's the impact of that on their productivity? A third area we're looking into is alopecia areata. That's an immune disease characterized by hair loss on both the head and the body. It's highly visible and patients have reported they feel like they're losing their identity. It commonly affects women and children, and it's associated with depression, anxiety, social stigma, and, and yet again, we, uh, we don't know uh, what's the impact on quality of life. That's what we're looking into. In terms of outcomes-based agreement, um, so in certain circumstances, it's, a, uh, it's an approach that puts the patient at the center of decision. So we can use real world evidence to accelerate access, reimbursement, while we gather additional evidence on outcomes. Another example is where plan members can get broader coverage, for example, and access earlier in the disease progression, uh, thereby obtaining cl greater clinical benefits. And then we agree on how to measure appropriate utilization. There are many sources of data, and, and we've seen a table uh, from uh, Nicole, many tables. Uh, one that is accessible to manufacturers is uh, PSP, Patient Support Programs data. There are so many patient support programs in Canada, uh, and they provide services to patients uh, impacted by some of the most severe conditions. So, um, there's a lot of interest in using PSP data, uh, but there are also preoccupations. So at Pfizer, we did a project uh, to demonstrate, to, a pilot, to demonstrate that a PSP can be used as, as a source of real-world evidence in a way that's compliant, ethical, and uh, with best practices. So it was done uh, also to address access gaps for one of our oncology treatments uh, that had phase two data and was reimbursed in more than 30 countries uh, around the world. So we did uh, a pilot and one of the, well, the strength of that project uh, really is that we were, it was prospective. So we proactively planned the data that we wanted to collect and then uh, we collected it. We had uh, top clinical experts inputting into uh, the protocol development. Uh, so that's also uh, important. That was a novel project. So we looked at a change in quality of life, time to discontinuation, and the patient journey. Um, we had ethics uh, committee approval, and the patients specifically consented for the data collection. So meaning they could uh, be enrolled in the patient support program and get the, ser the full services with or without participating in the data collection. And at the end of the day, it, it confirmed uh, the phase two data and um, the clinical experts who helped with the design are now supporting the publication of the data. So I think that speaks to its credibility and we compared it with uh, CADET's uh, draft real-world evidence guidance, and it has a, sort, a score of 90%. So it seems like it's uh, pretty robust. And finally, uh, I, I uh, think everyone agrees that real-world evidence is an area that's evolving very quickly. 
and it does require a lot of stakeholder dialogue um, to assess all angles and, and get to the best possible opportunities. So we have set up a masterclass, uh, which is led by globally recognized experts in real-world evidence, um, to see how real-world evidence can enhance uh, HTA and payer decision-making. So we've had two of these events already. There were many Canadian uh, public and private sector participants, patient groups as well. The feedback was good. So I encourage everyone to continue uh, to get more knowledgeable in the area of, of real-world evidence. So in conclusion, uh, the workforce in Canada is counting on all of us to provide um, access as quickly as possible, appropriately, timely and appropriately, uh, to drug treatments, and vaccines, and in some cases we'll need real-world evidence um, to help facilitate the value assessment and the reimbursement decision. And the best way to make that happen is to collaborate as early as possible in the process uh, so that we can make sure that all the perspectives are taken into account. And let's remember that time is life. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. It's so great to hear the pharmaceutical industry is committed to generating real world evidence, and in particular, um, generating evidence that's actually um, relevant to plan sponsors. Actually, I attended that master class, and it was an excellent opportunity to learn from experts from around the world. Um, so that was, that was great. Catherine is our final speaker, and she will share what her group is doing to fill evidence gaps. Thank you, Daria. So hi, everyone. It's a real pleasure and privilege to participate in the TELUS Health Annual Conference on the use of real-world evidence to enhance reimbursement decision-making for Canadian payers and to bring the consultant's perspective. So as a partner at Perifarm, a Canadian consulting company that specializes in health economics and market access, I've had the chance to be involved in several market access initiatives for many companies. Uh, briefly, Perifarm has an established expertise in pharmacoeconomics and outcomes research for 20 years uh, and has been involved in, in numerous submissions to Canadian uh, public and private payers which has allowed us to acquire in-depth knowledge of the Canadian healthcare system and payers' requirements. So typically, clients uh, ranging from local to global pharma leaders contact us in order to maximize the market access in Canada for a specific drug. So as a consultant, we develop all the key components of the submission dossier in order to provide to the payer comprehensive evidence to better inform decisions. Then the payers, both public and private payers, will evaluate the submission dossier and issue a reimbursement recommendation. So based on our experience with the development of submission dossier, uh, these dossiers are prepared using the best available evidence, which typically includes the randomized control trials. Uh, randomized control trials, in general, support Health Canada's decision uh, on the market authorization uh, in Canada. Indeed, uh, randomized control trials address the, key con the main concern of Health Canada on whether the product is safe and effective. However, when it comes to assess if a new drug should be reimbursed, uh, randomized controlled trials sometimes partially answer the questions asked by the payers. As Nicole mentioned earlier, payers are more interested in, know in knowing how does the new treatment compares with existing treatment. Is it of good value? Does it fulfill an important uh, unmet medical need? And payers are also interested in knowing what is the budget impact of listing this new drug on the formularies. So real-world evidence will often complement the data obtained in randomized controlled trials and will allow to provide a comprehensive picture of the therapeutic and economic value of a drug. 
So now I'm going to present different scenarios that we have faced as consultants where the gap in real-world evidence had a real impact on decision-making. So our first example uh, uh, concerns the, the development of a submission dossier for an oral treatment in women's health where the standard of care is an injectable. The advantages of this new drug were beyond its clinical efficacy since the, the clinical data supported an efficacy as equivalent as the standard of care. However, the, tr the treatment convenience associated with an oral therapy uh, compared to an injectable would most likely be associated with greater patient satisfaction and increased treatment adherence. However, at the time of the preparation of the submission, no evidence was available to support this statement. So due to the gap of real-world evidence, payers were not able to recognize the real value of the innovation. Another example concerns a new drug in mental health, more specifically for a condition known to have a significant burden on patients and caregivers. So at the time we were preparing the um, submission dossier, no Canadian evidence were available on work productivity and caregiver burden. So we had to use data from another country to build the submission dossier. So here, the gap in Canadian real-world evidence led to an increased uncertainty in economic evaluation and as well in the payers' assessments. Uh, a last example concerns a new drug in rare disease. As it is often the case uh, in rare diseases, limited Canadian evidence on the disease was available. So we had to use uh, data from another similar disease to estimate patients' quality of life, health state utility values, as well as healthcare resource utilization. So here again, the gap in real-world evidence led to increased uncertainty in the pharmacoeconomic evaluations, as well as in the payers' assessment. This concern is even more important in the, con in the context of high-cost drugs in rare diseases. So in summary, these three examples clearly demonstrate that the gap in real-world evidence has a significant impact on decision-making. Today, there is limited Canadian data on disease burden to demonstrate the clinical and economic value of a new drug. Furthermore, there are few patient-reported outcome data available in Canada at the time we prepare the submission dossiers to the payers. This is why we have recently launched the Proxy Network, which is an initiative that aims to generate patient-centered evidence because we believe that the patient's voice should be at the core of healthcare decisions. So what is the Proxy Network? The Proxy Network is an innovative research network that aims to generate patient-centered evidence in order to better inform the decision-making. So the Proxy Networks allows conducting real-world studies with the highest standard for confidentiality and security of data. More specifically, the Proxy Network is an innovative real-world evidence research platform uh, that allows to collect data directly from the patients and from caregivers. So participants that um, are eligible for a proxy study can be identified through an established network of community pharmacists that are already willing and ready to participate in a study. Patient ident identification can also be done uh, through the patient's associations. So the patient reported outcomes that can be collected through the proxy networks are presented here. So we are interested in collecting the signs and symptoms uh, of the disease, the, the functioning, the impact on activities of daily living, the impact of, on productivity loss, namely the impact of, uh, on absenteeism and presenteeism, which is of great interest uh, for the private payers. Uh, quality of life and preference-based measures. Uh, we also collect data on healthcare resource utilization, treatment satisfaction, and caregiver burden. So as an example, we are very proud to have completed our first proxy study in the treatment of migraine. So the objective of this study was to estimate the impact of migraine on work productivity and activity impairment in adults being treated with a tryptin. 
Overall, 100 participants uh, were included in the study and completed uh, a questionnaire on work and activity impairment through our web-based platform or by paper based on their preference. So this first proxy study uh, confirmed the feasibility and efficiency of the proxy network to generate real-world evidence in a timely manner. Uh, considering that uh, at the beginning uh, with the, uh, the, the, the protocol redaction and the, uh, getting the ethics approval and finally analyzing the result, it was all completed within a four-month period. So in conclusion, Canadian payers need comprehensive evidence on the therapeutic and economic value of a, of a new drug. However, available evidence, which typically includes the randomized controlled trial, does not always provide the full picture of the impact of a drug. Furthermore, a few Canadian-based patient-centered evidence is available at the time uh, of the preparation of the submission dossier. So we truly believe that patients deserve to be at the core of healthcare decisions. Although real-world evidence will never replace the randomized controlled trial, it undeniably brings value to drug assessment and help better inform decisions. Considering the increasing cost of specialty drugs and drug for rare diseases, real-world evidence will certainly become a pillar in healthcare decision-making. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Catherine. Your proxy network is very exciting as a patient's voice is often left out of the decision-making process. So now for the fun part. Um, I'd like to start um, the discussion here amongst the panelists uh, with a question uh, for Bobby. Uh, Bobby, how does Canada Life use real-world evidence in its decision-making currently to determine value? Yeah, great question, Maria. I mean, I think we, we incorporate more real world data uh, as much as we can. You know, I mentioned that the kind of data sources we're working with um, aren't necessarily as robust as we would like. And so we really look for things like claims patterns or um, patient reported outcomes uh, wherever we can. But unfortunately, that true evidence that we're talking about here today with that academic rigor around it and those structures is pretty hard to come by. So, you know, when we're doing our drug evaluations, we do try to take into account effectiveness in the real world as much as we can. Um, but, I, you know, I think that that's a real gap for us is, is getting that true evidence and uh, getting that quantitative assessment as opposed to that more qualitative um, trend-based uh, based work. Overall, though, we are trying to get that life cycle approach, like I said, whether it's, you know, looking at qualitative data up front um, or, you know, trying to measure effectiveness later on in the cycle once something's been out for a little while and, and validate some of our assumptions. Those are things we work in wherever we can. Uh, I'm hoping that this is the start of a conversation, though, that, that helps improve access to that true evidence. Yeah, I mean, I think that's I think that's the beauty of this of this panel is that we have all these different perspectives. We have producers and we have decision makers. So, um, you know, I guess I'd put the question then to Karen. I, I thought it was interesting that using your patient support program data um, in that program, did you consult decision makers as to determine like what outcomes should you be collecting as part of your patient support program? Mm -hmm. So um, we did, uh, you know, present the concept uh, to HTE in its, in its early um, design, but it was really a novel project and uh, we had input from practitioners and, and experts uh, to make sure that we not only took the data that is available and timely in a patient uh, support program, and also not do anything that uh, would um, diminish the quality of the services of that program. Because at the end of the day, the basis is that it's a, a program to support patients. We also got uh, input to make sure that the outcomes that we we're measuring were clinically uh, important and for payers, but the reality is that as more and more payers 
uh, accept real-world evidence, we try as much as possible to incorporate their perspective uh, early in our real-world evidence data generation plan. And that's really the key, is if we can have a conversation uh, not after the drug is on the market, that's too late, earlier, and then we can identify concerns or gaps that we want to uh, tackle that allows us to find what are the important outcomes, where the data is, how we can access it, and develop a plan that meets uh, the requirements and the threshold for that, for that particular decision. Yeah, I think that's great, and I guess um, you know, this, the, the offering, expanding the early scientific advice program at Cadith to now incorporate, you know, discussions around your real world evidence plans will definitely help in that regard. Um, do you see an opportunity, like is there a process for incorporating private payers in, in that discussion? Um, I don't know if Bobby, you wanna comment about how that might look for you or um, if you have discussions with uh, with with uh, industry to to try and get the outcomes that you need, yeah, you know, I'm happy to kind of start. Um, you know, I was really interested in hearing uh, about some of the um, current work that Pfizer is doing around just trying to quantify the impact of certain diseases and and really get at what's happening in the real world. I think that's a great first step, and it's certainly something we're interested in, in being able to quantify a bit better. Um, what does productivity look like, you know, for a for a, a particular disease condition and the burden that, that it can bring? Um, the Perifarm study and migraines, again, really interesting. So these are absolutely conversations that we would love to be a part of and help guide because we do have a, a unique perspective um, that I do think is really complementary to a lot of the other stakeholders, patients and prescribers and the public payers. We're all looking for much the same things, but the details of what a private plan is looking for can be unique. And, um, you know, to, to not have those conversations with us means that you're missing uh, that perspective. Right. Um, so, Nicole, you know, you're offering this program. Do you think there is again, opportunity potentially for private payers to engage in in your expanded program? Yeah, I mean, it's such a good question. And, and thanks for all the speakers. I mean, really an opportunity to think differently around how we've been doing our work. Um, and if you remember that slide that I had for the best brains exchange, the last part was collaboration. Uh, and so how do we actually understand what's happening in the private space? Um, and then how do we link that or have conversations about the relationship between private and public? I mean, all, all very important elements. And it really just rounds out the way that we think about new technologies. So certainly an opportunity. Um, we can certainly explore more. Uh, you know, we're just launching this program for now sponsors uh, to think about, you know, what kind of elements to include what kinds of outcomes would be important? And, you know, as we think about the best practices now from across the globe has been to have this sort of multi-stakeholder approach to bring in people for, who are the patients, um, patient communities, the, the public, you know, the payers, the data holders, um, the clinicians, right, to understand what are the most important outcomes. And I can tell you from some of the learning projects when we brought together all of those groups, everybody had a slightly different outcome that they were concerned about or were thought that was the most important outcome. And so, you know, how do we then bring all that together into something that makes sense? And maybe you don't always need one outcome, right? Maybe there's a different way of approaching it. And I think uh, that that's what we sort of learned in, in our learning period to allow us to think about how do we how do we think about data in a different way and, and even just access data? So, you know, the comment about lost productivity, you know, what do we, do we have robust data sources? One of the projects that we worked on was with Stats Canada. Um, Stats Canada has keyboards for everybody in Canada. And if you didn't remember to file on May 1st, um, up to you. Uh, but, um, you know, and that is underemployment, employment, disability claims. Like there are different ways of accessing data and thinking about travel to sites. And so we were exploring opportunities if we had a question that would allow us to understand employment, underemployment, or um, distance, right? How do we figure that out? And, you know, leveraging some of the, the, like I said, very rich data that we have in our country, but we haven't used it for those kinds of purposes before. Uh, and so I think this is an opportunity for all of us and in, in the private space, for sure, you know, 
thinking about your presenteeism, your absenteeism, you know, how do we start to think about that? Um, and then it always comes back to, well, what kind of study design did you have? You know, how robust was that study design? And hearing, um, you know, that you had, uh, Kareen, from the Pfizer perspective, you know, you sort of looked at, we met 90% of the criteria, even just telling us what the criteria were or the elements were is important. That's typically not available. Uh, and so, you know, understanding if you did have consent or if you were allowed to link and who holds the data set, you know, very sort of common metrics that I already indicated we take for granted in a clinical trial space, we don't often have in this space. So starting with understanding where the data comes from. Um, and even, you know, across the country, uh, thinking about, you know, uh, if I had British Columbia data, would PEI accept it, for example, or, you know, thinking different ways about data and, you know, understanding then how to leverage that information. Yeah, that's great. Great. Yes, please. No, I just wanted to add a point about transparency. Uh, that's really important. And if the data, depending on where it comes from, how it was collected, I think what's key is to share exactly and be transparent into um, what it is. And so that can allow a payer to recognize the limitations and recognize the real value of that data for them. Uh, but it can still have a usefulness. It can still be uh, sufficiently credible for payers to make certain types of decisions and maybe not other types of decisions. But I thought that's a, a great point is to say we need to be really clear on what it is that we're, that we're presenting in a, in a particular submission or collecting. Mm -hmm. and, and so you can give my talk for me in two weeks when we're launching some of the real reporting guidelines on uh, real world evidence, because that's really the point. It is about just understanding in a transparent way what actually data is collected and how. Oh, that's great. Um, you know, uh, two thirds of Canadians have private um, private coverage. So there's clearly lots of data that that's out there. I know TELUS alone has lots of data on um, in our book of business that has lots of claims. We have an electronic health record. We have, you know, health units. So there's lots of potential um, data there that maybe we can we can leverage at, at some point. Um, so Catherine, with the work that you do, um, you sort of the interface between, uh, you know, industry, uh, pharmaceutical industries and decision makers, um, how, are you, how are you able to balance that, like the needs of the manufacturers to get you know, reimbursement access uh, versus uh, decision makers need to make like informed, really informed decisions um, to enhance, you know, the value in that decision making process? Yeah, well, thanks, Daria. That's a really good question. Uh, in fact, as consultants, we work really closely with our clients that want to maximize uh, the market access for their drug. And what we, we, what we do in order to fulfill the needs of the payer is we prepare a dossier sh demonstrating the value of that drug, value from a therapeutic standpoint and from an economic standpoint. Um, and we, we do that with the best rigor possible because uh, I'm sure Bobby and Nicole will agree, uh, payers are expecting rigor and transparency in the submission dossiers. So that's how we, uh, we handle uh, this, uh, the, okay, the needs with our clients. Yeah, it's, it's a tricky, tricky one, <laughs> <laughs> balancing those needs. Um, so I, I, I hate that we're running out of time, so I honestly think we could stay here all, all day. There's so many topics. Uh, one that I do want to sort of talk about quickly before I open it up to uh, questions from the audience is around, uh, you know, people have, three of the panelists for sure, have mentioned some variation of using real world evidence after making a decision to list a drug. Um, it might be called an evidence-based agreement, um, outcomes-based managed entry agreement, innovative contracting, whatever we call that. Um, you know, Bobby, I guess starting with you, have you engaged in these? I mean, it's part of your role is do product listing agreements. Is OBA and outcomes-based agreements part of that role? And if so, have you managed to, to make that happen? Yeah, you know, it's something that I'm, I'm very interested in expanding. Um, we've worked 
in those real world data points as much as we can into our agreements that, that makes sense. But I wouldn't say that we have a true outcomes based agreement uh, in place today. And it's um, something that, you know, I, I hope we can pursue in the future with the right opportunity. But the um, ability to, to validate those assumptions after a drug has already come up onto the market is really, uh, I think, an important part of access and an important part of managing a drug plan effectively. Because, you know, I think it's easy to think about um, the data coming in and then there being less access. But there's also data that can come in and show us that it's actually appropriate for more patients or, or a bigger um, patient population. So knowing those things and really being able to assess value after the fact is, is an important um, part of drug plan management in the future. And I think that there's two ways to go about it. We've got these kind of academic evidence-based studies that we're talking about. And then you've also got that individual level um, outcomes-based agreement that, that could be a part of the tools kit uh, to, to leverage all this data in a way that, that makes sense for plans and um, make sure that members are getting the, the clinical value that we're, we're expecting. Yeah, I guess they, they would really have a role in, especially drugs for rare diseases, where you're never going to get the level of clinical data that you really want in those mm -hmm. spaces. And, and maybe this is a way to get, get um, plan sponsors to have, you know, uh, beneficiaries to, to get access to these, you know, innovative medications. Yeah, uh, like you said, it, it's a way to um, have that access with some shared risk, right? Mm -hmm. When we're talking about uncertainty in a clinical package, there's risk that's associated with that. And we um, need to manage it, whether it's, you know, safety or, or effectiveness risk. And these models uh, using real world data points, uh, I think are really powerful way to, to do that. Okay. Um, Karen, I don't know if you want to comment on, on whether you've actually engaged in an outcomes-based agreement with a payer and, and how that's... We have uh, in a very limited uh, number of, of cases because, as we said, this is, it takes a unique situation. Mm -hmm. I can think of one uh, that where the agreement uh, allowed plan member to access uh, the therapy when it was most advantageous for them in terms of timing uh, to improve outcomes. And then we agreed to risk share under certain conditions. Uh, so that's one example of if there is a need to enter an agreement. So rare disease could be an area where when there's a high unmet need, high uncertainty, what can we do to make sure that patients who need the drug now don't have to wait two years, three years until we collect, um, we enroll more patients in a trial, for example, but then make sure that we have the appropriate uh, effectiveness assessed afterwards, pro the proper utilization as well. So really the idea is to, um, it's an approach that puts that reflects the value of the drug innovation, puts, again, the patient uh, at the center instead of focusing on, on the cost alone. Okay. We're also in discussions with public payers. I mean, the goal is really to have these discussions as early as possible. So uh, there are some therapies for which it's, uh, it's helpful to try to see in advance uh, what kind of innovative models we can have.